Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. I'm in Armenia, exploring one of the oldest stories in the world, the biblical tale of Noah and the Flood. It's a quest that'll take me diving for clues in lost prehistoric villages. Oh, wow. And climbing the slopes of Europe's most active volcano. To find out if any part of the story of Noah could possibly be true. I'm searching for the truth behind the tale of Noah and the Flood. My quest starts to the northeast of the Holy Land in the Republic of Armenia. It's here that the Bible gives its only clue as to where Noah's story took place, the mountains of Ararat, where Noah's Ark came to rest after the Great Flood. The people of Armenia have a particular closeness to this story. They believe that they, more than others, are the direct descendants of Noah himself. The story centers on a wrathful act of God. A great flood sent to punish mankind for its wickedness wreaks destruction on the earth. The Bible says only Noah and his family are to be spared. And God said to Noah, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. And of every living animal, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. The rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights, submerging every mountain. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. When the ark ran aground on the mountains of Ararat, Noah sent out a dove to search for land. When it returned with an olive branch, he knew the flood had finally receded. But is any of it true? There are four key elements to the story. The ark, the flood, the man called Noah, and the animals. My plan is to investigate all four. I'm starting with the Ark. According to the Bible, the flood wiped out all existing civilization, which means the Ark is the only major link between us and the pre-flood world. As far as holy relics go, searching for Noah's Ark ranks right up there with the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail. It seems like not a year goes by when someone doesn't claim to have found the resting place of the Ark. The trouble is a lack of evidence. That's not the case, however, with where I'm going now. The cathedral in the town of Ishmaezin claims to have an actual physical piece of the Ark itself. The cathedral was built in 301 AD, making it one of the oldest Christian churches in the world. Welcome to the Church of Holy Ishmaezin. What you're hearing, priests and monks singing on either side. I'm sure you can hear it, but what you're missing out on is the, the way it's resonating inside the church. It's like, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's rich, it's powerful, it's uh, holy. Father Kittrich Devedjian, an American Armenian priest who now lives here, is the keeper of the Ark. He has agreed to show me the holy relic. It's kept at the back of the cathedral, along with hundreds of other sacred artifacts. This is our reliquary museum in Holy Etchmiadzin. It's where we house and where we display all the relics that are the most valuable possessions of the Armenian church. Father Kittrich shows me a piece of wood believed to be from the Ark itself. It is so revered that it's encased in gold and silver. So how does a church in Armenia have a piece of the Ark from Noah? Uh, according to the 4th and 5th century Armenian and Greek historians, a bishop of the church named James led a group of pilgrims up the side of the mountain in search of the Ark. As he ascended the mountain, the group obviously tired, and he fell asleep. And in, the, in a dream that he has, an angel of the Lord appears to him and calls out to him and says, James, you will not be able to reach the peak of the mountain to see the Ark, mm -hmm. but as a reward for your efforts, you'll be given a piece of the ark when you awaken. And when he woke up from the dream, there was a piece of the ark under his head. And that was this piece? That was this piece, and it was brought here and kept here in Holy Etchmiadzin. Has anyone ever found any other pieces? Uh, many Armenians, as well as non-Armenians, have made pilgrimages up Mount Ararat with hopes of finding the ark. Many have also said they have seen the ark, but none have returned back with a piece of the ark. So if one were to say, that's, that's a great story, 
fantastic box, uh, it's well preserved, but how do we actually know that this is from the ark, from Noah and the ark? My answer, my answer would be that we accept it on faith. We accept many things on faith. From the perspective of a man of the cloth, that makes sense, and I respect that. But from a man of science, it's like, well, let's carbon date it. Has anyone ever asked to carbon date this wood? Uh, not to my knowledge, Josh, no. So if I were to start a conversation with the church and determine if it's, we can find a lab that's mutually agreeable, and then we could test a piece of this wood to see if it's carbon dated to the time of Noah, maybe? Josh, let me tell you, you are more than welcome to make the request. But for the Armenian people and the Armenian nation, for centuries we've received and we've accepted that this is a piece of the ark based on faith alone. And that faith has been enough to sustain all of us. I think what we'll do is probably put it back in the case. I will send a letter to the church. We'll see if that goes anywhere. But for now, I'm going to continue looking for other physical evidence in my quest. Be my guest. OK, but thank you. This has been a, an honor and a privilege. Can I touch it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I touching the art. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Faith may be all the Armenian church needs, but I'm hoping to find concrete proof. Although the Bible states that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, no one has ever found it. And if I went up there, I could spend months wandering around looking. As for the relic, my request to carbon date it continues to be tied up in red tape. So I decide to leave Armenia and the ark and concentrate on finding evidence of the Great Flood. According to the Bible, it covered the whole of the earth. But has it left its mark? The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. No one has yet found solid evidence of a flood that fits the biblical story. But I've heard that a leading archaeologist currently doing research in Jerusalem has a radical new theory on Noah's flood. It was here where the story of Noah's flood was written down into the Bible in the 8th century BC. It's in the holy capital's old city where I've arranged to meet the archaeologist, Dr. Sean Kingsley. Sean. Hey, Josh. Hey. Sean has a doctorate in archaeology from Oxford University in England. Like other academics on the hunt, he hasn't confined his search for the flood to Mount Ararat. The wise and the mad have been looking for evidence of the flood and the Noah from Mount Ararat to the Euphrates, from Bahrain to the Black Sea. And quite frankly, not a trace of solid hard evidence has turned up until now. Sean says he has compelling evidence that a flood of biblical proportions occurred around the Mediterranean basin at a time much earlier than the Bible. At the dawn of thinking man, the Stone Age. The tale of Noah's Ark and the Flood is actually the oldest story in the world. You know, by the time it's written down in the streets of Jerusalem right here in the 8th century BC, it's old news, it's 2,000 years old. The number of it, the basic idea of the Flood, first emerges in 2,700 BC um, in a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the first stories ever transcribed. It was written on clay tablets in the ancient language of Akkadian. In it is a story about a man called Utnapishtim. Like Noah, Utnapishtim survives a cataclysmic flood in a huge ark which he's filled with animals. And just like Noah, when the flood recedes, Utnapishtim sends out a dove to search for land. Coincide very neatly with the abandonment. The theory is that Utnapishtim and the Bible's Noah are based on the same man. Sean knows that ancient stories like this one were often passed down orally through countless generations before being written down. He reasons that the flood story originated during the Stone Age world known as the Neolithic period, when mankind had just left their caves and started to build primitive dwellings. And now, he's discovered an event that could have caused it. Not 40 days and nights of rain, but a geological catastrophe that struck the coastline of the Mediterranean. Well, just like us, Neolithic people were fighting their own demons. At the end of the Ice Age, massive global warming, rising seawaters. But on top of that, I think there was one specific killer trigger. 
Which was? Well, we had to go to the other side of the Mediterranean, to Mount Etna in Sicily, mm. where in 5600 BC, the top of the mountain fell into the sea. When that hit the Mediterranean, mm. it created a huge tsunami. And within three and a half hours, Josh, it had smashed into the coasts of Lebanon, Syria, and the Holy Land. That's a nice theory. I like that. Okay, so then, but wait, but then you're saying that the flood was caused by a tsunami. I'm saying this could have been, indeed, the killer trigger. Could a Stone Age tsunami be the basis of Noah's biblical flood? There's only one way to find out. Head to Sicily and look for clues on Mount Etna, Europe's most active volcano. Everyone knows the story of Noah and the flood. But now, a radical new theory claims that the flood was a tsunami that occurred in the Stone Age. I'm searching for evidence of the catastrophe at its starting place, the Italian volcano, Mount Etna. It's one of the world's most active volcanoes, spewing out millions of tons of lava every year in a near constant state of eruption. I'm now in Sicily on the eastern coast, just over there to my right is the Mediterranean, looming large in front of me is Europe's largest active volcano, Mount Etna. I've come here to see if Sean Kingsley's theory that a tsunami was created here 8,000 years ago, any proof can be found in the landscape today. I've enlisted the help of volcanologist Dr. Sonia Calvari. Hi, Hi. Josh. Yeah, come on in. Hi. Look, Edna's already busy smoking. Yeah. We're heading up the slopes of this eruptive peak looking for evidence of a massive Stone Age landslide that may have caused the tsunami of Noah's flood. So this is the end of the nice road. This is when it gets bumpy. Uh, pardon my ignorance about volcanoes, but how would we know if this isn't going to explode right now and kill us all? Because I have a mobile with me, yes. and my colleague will call me in case anything happens. He'll call you and say goodbye, nice knowing you? Just one month before I arrived, an eruption blasted hot ash thousands of feet into the air, covering the mountain and the surrounding towns. The ash from that blast still covers the slopes today. So this that we're walking on now, this is a mixture of dirt and ash? Yes, volcanic ash. So we're now walking on a volcano? Yeah, on a volcano that sometimes is doing explosive activity. As long as there's no explosive activity today. Well, hopefully, yes. Right now, the volcano is quiet. So Sonia agrees to take me to the part of Etna that she thinks will be of interest to my quest. She explains that each new eruption forms a new layer of lava on top of the last. The volcano grows higher and higher, until at a certain point it becomes too heavy and collapses, causing a huge landslide. We're hiking to the place where the last massive landslide occurred, a valley that was once a 5,000-foot high mountain. Everything that was this giant depression was once a mountain. Yes. And it just decided spontaneously to collapse. It fell down to collapse towards the sea, yes. What, what? And probably lasted just a few minutes. But that fast, I'm, so, I'm amazed at the speed. If all of this that I'm seeing here was down at the sea within a few minutes. It's like an avalanche, really. In fact, this is called a volcanic avalanche. Huh. And this is what happened 8,000 years ago here. How do, well, how do we know it was 8,000? How do we get the date? Because we managed to find a, a charcoal sample within mm -hmm. the rock, and we could date this charcoal, and the date was 8,000 years ago. But if we look at, let's say, the past 10,000 years only, would this be one of the most significant events? Yes, of course. Really? Yeah. A catastrophe? Yes, a big one. Go back down. So we have proof that a chunk of Mount Etna collapsed into the sea at the right time to fit Sean Kingsley's theory. But what happened next? Did it create a tsunami big enough to blot out mankind, as stated in the Bible? 
and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. To see the effect of a Manhattan-sized lump of rock crashing into the sea, Sonia sends me back down the slope to Mount Etna's volcanic mission control to meet expert geologist Dr. Maria Teresa Pereschi. This is uh, the room where we monitor Mount Etna volcano. This room is an early warning station for spotting potential eruptions. So if anything happens on Etna, the Can first control, to know. Yes. Well, as long, as long as everything here is quiet, maybe we can talk about the tsunami. Yes. OK? OK. If this thing goes crazy, tell me, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll change topics. Using a computer model, Maria Teresa has recreated the impact Mount Etna's volcanic avalanche had on the Mediterranean. You can see here, and this is Sicily. I'm curious to see if the result is a flood of biblical proportions. Oh, wow. The initial splash creates waves that are over 130 feet high. These waves travel faster than a passenger jet, and each one is over 15 miles wide. There goes Greece. When these waves hit the shore, they don't stop. They just keep on going, flooding everything in sight. Look at that. Some of these small islands are being submerged. This tsunami engulfs all the coastal lowlands from North Africa to Greece and beyond, creating what would have looked like a flood covering the known world. And now it's hitting uh, Israel. Uh, Israel is here. Maria Teresa believes this tsunami killed large numbers of Stone Age men and women living around the Mediterranean. So if someone was looking for a source for the flood in Noah, the Ark, and the flood story, this might be it. She thinks I might find evidence of destruction from this tsunami left behind in coastal Stone Age settlements. And she's even got a good idea of where I might look. There is a village today under the sea, a Neolithic village named Atlit Yam. Atlit Yam, Yam yes. is, a, is a Neolithic village. Atlit Yam is unique. It's the most complete 8,000-year-old Neolithic settlement ever discovered. Because sea levels have risen since the end of the last ice age, it's underwater today. But at the time of the tsunami, Atlit Yam was on dry land and right in the firing line. So if, if I wanted to find any kind of proof of this impact, that a tsunami came across the Mediterranean and hit Atlit Yam, it's possible I could see that by diving the site. Yes, definitely. I'm heading back to Israel, to a Stone Age village that's now submerged off the coast, searching for devastation left behind by a mega tsunami. Wow, look at the I'm looking for a breakthrough that could prove that Noah's flood was real. The biblical tale of Noah's great flood is one of the oldest stories in the world. Some believe that it was inspired by a real event, but despite repeated attempts, solid evidence of the flood has never been found. I'm hunting for proof that the flood was real. Following a lead from archaeologist Dr. Sean Kingsley that Noah's flood was a tsunami, I'm on a search for the signs of destruction it would have brought. I'm exploring the best preserved Stone Age settlement ever found on the sea floor, the ancient village of Atlit Yam, just off the coast of Israel. Well, I'm now back in the Holy Land, approximately 1,200 miles east of Mount Etna, here in the port of Haifa. From here, it's about 10 miles by boat to the archaeological village of Atlit Yam. The village is underwater now because over the last 8,000 years, sea levels have risen by 30 feet. But in the Stone Age, Atlit Yam was right on the coast. Hi, Udi, how are you? Bye. Dr. Ehud Galili is Israel's premier underwater archaeologist. He has agreed to help me on my quest. OK, Adnan, start the engine. Udi discovered Atlit Yam in 1985 when he was searching for shipwrecks. It was an incredible find, the most complete submerged Stone Age village in the world. So if a tsunami came across the Mediterranean and hit the coast of Israel, 
it would have hit Atlik Yam. A potential tsunami must have uh, affected them, no doubt about it. Could we look for indications of tsunami impact? If uh, uh, indeed the site was uh, deserted or destroyed in one catastrophic event of uh, five minutes, we should find some evidence for such an event. Indications of a tsunami strike include wrecked buildings and broken human bones. We will dive today in this section of the site, area G and N. Last week, a big storm hit this area, displacing tons of sand from the seabed and possibly exposing more of Atlit Yam's ancient secrets. It's a good sign, and Udi's confident we'll make new discoveries. The water's cold, the visibility poor, and I can't wait. This is a dive into one of the first settlements on the planet. In the hunt for proof of a tsunami that could be Noah's flood. And right away, we find something. These stones, he says, are part of an early Neolithic structure. But if the tsunami struck, it wouldn't have damaged a well below ground. I need to find things that were above ground when the wave hit. The remains of settlements, monuments, or even the Neolithic villagers themselves. I wouldn't mind finding a skull sticking out the ground. Udi's found something else. Atlit Yam's clay soil has protected this bone for eight millennia, and Udi thinks it belonged to some kind of large Stone Age animal. But it's not the human bone I was hoping to find. The currents are getting stronger, making our task that much harder. This is, this is probably the biggest challenge of underwater archaeology. Through the sediment and seaweed, I spot a structure. Udi has seen this before. It's a Stone Age temple. And it could hold the key to whether or not this village was hit by a tsunami. My quest to find proof of Noah's flood has taken me to one of the oldest settlements in the world, a submerged Neolithic village off the coast of Israel. I'm searching for evidence that a cataclysmic tsunami destroyed this village 8,000 years ago. With the help of Dr. Udi Galili, I've already found a Neolithic animal bone which I plan to examine later. But now, I've spotted something even better. A Stone Age temple that may give me the proof I'm looking for. And he was explaining to me that this is a ritual center. This is a marker. Think of Stonehenge, a temple. This prehistoric temple has been standing for at least 8,000 years. I don't know if our Konami is here. They want to move these stones. But they just fill in formation. Which means my dive is over all too soon. I've discovered an ancient well, an animal bone, and a temple, but so far no evidence of a tsunami. Because is it possible that the evidence is down there, just hasn't been found yet? Because it would seem that if a huge chunk of Mount Etna falls over 1,200 miles, that wave would eventually hit here. It is, it is possible. Even though I didn't find wrecked buildings or human bones, 
Udi tells me that three days ago, he raised two human skeletons. Maybe there is some evidence in the bones that you have already brought up. Um, or maybe put it this way, can I at least look at the bones of course you that can you brought look. up? Of course. Just because I'm thorough. The bones have already been sent to a university medical school in Tel Aviv. So while I wasn't lucky enough to find any human bones at Adlit Yam, thankfully Dr. Galili has been more successful in the past. He sends his bones here to Tel Aviv University. I've come to take a look at those bones and to learn what story they can tell. Forensics expert Dr. Israel Hershkovitz is the man in charge of analyzing them. Welcome thank to my you. lab. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You have, in your lab, you've got bones from Athlete Young. Yes, right? sure. Human bones. Human bones. Just human bones. The two sets of skeletons from Athlete Young have been left soaking in fresh water. This is a human bone from Athlete Young? Yes. I was looking for this. No. Okay. I'm so glad that you have these. After three days, you get rid of the clay. So this okay. has been sitting in water for three days? For three days now. First, we scrub them clean. Is that good? Yeah, very good. Then they have to be reassembled. The most challenging part is the skull, as they typically arrive in hundreds of tiny fragments. Israel's assistants glue them together. It's like working on a 3D jigsaw puzzle. They come in a very fragmentary condition. This painstaking work helps Israel figure out the cause of death. If you compare the bones of Atlit Yam with the bones of other tsunamis, like let's say the, the Christmas 2004 tsunami in Indonesia, can you look at the breaks in Indonesia and the breaks in Atlit Yam? Yes, we can compare them. I mean, if, if it comes to the fracture, the, to the pattern of fractures, mm -hmm. then you can compare them because the type of fracture you see in tsunami victims are very different from the type of fractures that you see among the Atlit Yam individuals. Looking at the people of Atlit Yam in the Neolithic, did a tsunami happen? Well, there are no evidence for, for, for a colossal disaster like a tsunami at Atlit Yam. And most of the deaths were natural? Yes, natural cause of death, I would say so. Israel tells me that all the skeletons raised so far were unearthed from Neolithic graves and were not victims of a sudden cataclysm. But he still thinks it's possible that there is evidence of a tsunami yet to be discovered. I mean, the bones that we have from Atlit Yam do not tell the story of a tsunami. Okay. No, not at all. But it's still possible that the, the whole village was washed away and people who were killed uh, in the tsunami were washed to the deep sea someplace. And what we see is what was left from the side, you know, before the tsunami. Sure. The bodies that were buried yes. before everyone During the, the hundreds of years that the village existed. Absolutely. So was the Great Flood a tsunami or not? The evidence from Mount Etna is compelling, but I found no hint of it here on the coast of Israel. So I knew, when I started this journey, how hard it would be to find evidence of Noah and the ark. It's, this is the earliest part of the Bible. Aside from Adam and Eve, it doesn't get any older than this. What I didn't expect was how any evidence I did find would be subject to so much interpretation. It's like everything you want to hold on to, ooh, this could be true, that could be true, then someone else can come along and go, eh, not really. It's, uh, it's daunting, and yet it's also exhilarating at the same time. Despite not finding solid proof of the tsunami, my dive on Adlit Yam was not in vain. The animal bone that I dug up is about to lead me to not only the truth behind the animals that Noah might have saved, but also to proof of a real Neolithic ark. I'm exploring the truth behind the story of Noah and the flood. It's one of the oldest stories in the world, possibly dating back to the Stone Age. So far, I've scaled Europe's most explosive volcano and discovered evidence of a tsunami oh, wow. that could have triggered the flood. I dove Atlit Yam, a sunken Neolithic village, and found a Stone Age animal bone. Now I'm going to use that bone to find out what creatures could have been on the ark. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creepeth upon the ground, 
there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark. I'm taking my animal bone to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where archaeozoologist Dr. Leora Horwitz has agreed to identify it. Leora? Yes. Josh? Hi, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. I bring you a gift from the Neolithic. <laughs> it's rather murky. <laughs> it is. Wow. Serious piece, yeah. Leora immediately recognizes yeah, the bone. That way, and I'd look here, you see we've got this little mm -hmm. indentation, mm -hmm. and it That's correlates good. with that exactly. It's part of the lower leg of a now extinct type of giant cow called an auroch. These seven foot tall beasts were the forefathers of our modern day cows. The villagers of Atlik Yam had started domesticating them. There is actually a point, and people stopped hunting. We're standing right in front of it, the Neolithic. People are exploiting domestic sheep, domestic goat, cattle, and pigs. So then, uh, trying to get a sense of the animals that were at, let's say, Noah's Ark through Atlit Yam. Yes. We have goats, cattle, boars. If the Ark had these animals, it'd be more of a floating farm than a floating zoo. Indeed. OK. Well, that's, that's, I'm sure that's heartbreaking for kids all over the world who picture lots of animals two by two. But you're saying the bones, as far as the archaeology here, in Israel, the bones don't support that kind of diversity. Certainly not from the Neolithic. This evidence doesn't follow the Bible's version of events, that every living creature on Earth went onto the ark. But discovering farm animals at Atlit Yam does fit in with the Epic of Gilgamesh, the text on which some believe the biblical story of Noah is based. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, it says, all the beasts and animals of the field had to go up into the ark. The animals of the field is a direct reference to cattle, just like my auroch. It's the sort of animal that Noah could have saved. But does Leora think that Stone Age man, with his primitive technology, could have built an ark? The million dollar question here then, regarding the, the portability of these animals, is there any indication that in the Neolithic period, animals were being put on ships? Well, we have one spectacular example, which is earlier than the material from Atlitium, mm -hmm. and that's from Cyprus. Where, where, wait, sorry, so in Cyprus, people were actually moving animals by boat? Indeed. I'm going to Cyprus. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. I plan to. Leora says that on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, there's evidence that Stone Age man transported animals across the sea. It's a lead that I just can't ignore. At this resort city in Paphos, Dr. Paul Croft from Edinburgh University found the remains of a 12,000-year-old Stone Age settlement. You picked an unusual spot to meet. It is indeed an unusual spot, and I'd be very pleased to show you in what ways it's unusual archaeologically. OK. This site was discovered by accident when the foundations of the resort were laid down. They, they continued building over it. Yeah, exactly. I located the feet. In the foundations is a Stone Age well, complete with its original footholds. It's where Paul made an extraordinary discovery. As his team excavated deeper and deeper into the well, they started to uncover animal bones. Paul is taking me down the well to show me some of the bones he has discovered. He thinks they're Neolithic food scraps. People were eating food around the, the wellhead, mm -hmm. and with the passage of time as the well filled in, some of the detritus, the rubbish that was left over from these meals, would have been washed in with, with the silts. And you said this is just a small sample of the bones you've Sure, we, ha we have thousands upon thousands of bones. Some larger and more impressive looking ones, and, and these are back up at our field station. At Paul's field station, I start to recognize some of the bones. Goats, cattle, and boar, just like the ones living at Atlit Yam. Okay, so then what makes these bones special? They didn't occur here naturally, and they must have been brought here with the first human colonists of the island. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so, so these were, what, shipped here? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Paul, isn't it possible that these animals came here on a land bridge? 
Is that, is that uh, a possible theory? It's often suggested, but there is no real geological evidence for any kind of land route to Cyprus after, say, five and a half million years ago. So, yeah, we can cancel that out as being an explanation. But this, what I like about this is that archaeology here in Cyprus is showing that in the Neolithic, people had the capacity to build boats to transport animals. Yeah, that's without doubt the case. And if one wanted to call this floating farm of animals an ark, one could. One could, yes. I like that. I like it. This is good evidence. It seems that Neolithic people on the Mediterranean had the ability to build boats for animals. This supports archaeologist Sean Kingsley's theory that the Noah story could have taken place during the Stone Age. But what about the person who, according to the Bible, built the ark? What can I find out about the man we call Noah? Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. The Bible doesn't mention where he lived or when. However, back in Israel on the Carmel Mountains that overlook the Neolithic settlement of Atlit Yam, archaeologist Dr. Sean Kingsley thinks he has the answers. I believe that there was a real-life Noah. We don't know his name. And I think he lived in a Neolithic village off the Carmel. And this is the real reason why I wanted to bring you here. Sean claims to have groundbreaking evidence about the man who survived the Great Flood. Am I about to come face to face with the real Noah? I'm on a quest to determine the truth behind the story of Noah's flood. Archaeologist Dr. Sean Kingsley has brought me to Israel's coast, just inland from the submerged Neolithic village Atlit Yam. He claims to know the identity of the hero of this biblical story. I wanted to take you up this mountain to give you an idea of who the real Noah actually was and uh, what he was doing in this sacred landscape. Sean thinks Noah is from the Stone Age and that he could have come from around Atlit Yam. It's a bold claim, especially since I didn't find any concrete evidence of the tsunami that Sean says triggered the flood. I mean, I, I went to Sicily, I saw Mount Etna, I saw where the, the tsunami would have started. But to then come here with perhaps an expectation of finding devastation, finding some sediment in turmoil, seeing a village with broken bones and, and devastation, we're not seeing it. I think, Josh, it's a really hard site to dive. You know, it's enormous, it's 200,000 square feet, and only maybe 2% of it at any time is naturally exposed. For me, we still need to do more research. It sounds like, but certainly one can argue that the evidence is out there, but not yet found, right? Yeah, I think the, uh, there's a lot more skeletons to come out of that cupboard. If Sean's right, and Noah lived here 8,000 years ago, who was he? The picture you've got in your head of a noble man, righteous, blameless in his generation, with a long white beard and flowing robes. Right. Throw that away. You know, that's a Hollywood illusion. You know, the real Noah would have been what I would call a seer, but which contemporary society calls a shaman. This guy was part doctor, social worker, magician, mystic, and also a poet. Sean sees Noah as a tribal leader, one of the most important men in the village. Here we go. We're heading for caves where he believes Stone Age shaman, maybe even the real Noah, performed ceremonies. Describe for me who Noah was. He was a guy who lived down in a village very much like Atlit, mm -hmm. who took the tribe from this location after the flood into a better world. And every year, certainly, at the winter or the summer solstice, he would be told the great story of how he lived through a real life terror. And in that story, as it was told, was then spread throughout the region, giving birth to not just the Noah story, but the other similar stories we see in, in the Mediterranean. That's right. But why do you think that Noah was a VIP, a mystic, a shaman at all? Why couldn't he have just been the average person who happened to survive this flood? Because you need someone with that authority, that status in the tribal society, okay. that when he told this story, it would be accepted by everybody. Sean believes the real Noah was a Stone Age shaman. He survived the Great Flood to tell his story, a story that was passed down through the centuries. It's an interesting theory, but so far I haven't seen any physical proof. How do we know anything at all about prehistoric Neolithic shamans? There's no book of shamans. There's no writing. There's not even any scribbles on the walls here. 
Interestingly enough, in the cave just across the valley here, they have a ritual area where there are skeletons with their heads cut off. These plastered Stone Age heads that Sean believes used to be shaman are now on display at Jerusalem's Rockefeller Museum. This is it. This is what I want to show you in all its fine glory. Welcome to the face of the ancestors. This head is 8,500 years old. It's one of the first sculptures ever made. Sean says that underneath the plaster is a real human skull. So this might have looked kind of like the person who once had this skull. Yes, I think that's correct, although a little bit more squashed. Because it looks, <laughs> looks a bit squashed. Because you know they've taken the mandible off here, so actually they've had to put the lips where the nose would be, and the nose is up here on the forehead area. And you believe also this is a shaman, a mystic, a seer? Yeah. This thing was found in a ritual death center. Within this area, they found the skeletal body of a gazelle whose head had been removed, and in place, they'd put this specific head. On top of a gazelle skeleton? Correct. There was kind of a hybrid creature, half human, half animal. This is really interesting, because when shamans go into their trance, into the dream world, they travel to the spirit area with an animal. The animal's their guide. So I think that this shaman may actually have been buried with his shaman guide. These skulls certainly show that Stone Age people didn't practice religion the way we do now. But I'm not convinced that they prove that Noah was a shaman. I think Sean's theory is just that, a theory. I, mean, I, I appreciate that you believe that Noah was a real person. It's just that the level that you take it to, some would say, mm, over the line. You I don't think, think so. I think it makes a lot more sense than what we're reading in the book of Genesis, which is propaganda. Sean may not believe the biblical description of Noah's flood, but it could be said that without irrefutable evidence, his belief is also, in a way, based on faith. My quest to learn the truth behind the story of Noah has come full circle. I've explored Sean's theory that 8,000 years ago, a tsunami decimated the Mediterranean coastline killing most of the inhabitants of this Stone Age world. One man, a leader, survives to pass the tale of the Great Flood onto future generations. Some ancient civilizations called him Utnapishtim, but we know him as Noah. So how much of this story is fact, and how much is fiction? There's no doubt that during the Neolithic, People here in the Mediterranean had the ability to transport animals by boat. There's also no doubt that the eastern side of Mount Etna actually collapsed into the ocean, creating a massive tsunami. Now, whether or not that tsunami actually hit Israel with such force as to destroy Adlit Yam, or whether the man, Noah, was based on a shaman or a seer of the time, the evidence there might not be as conclusive. But the possibility always exists. As scientists like to say, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But until that evidence is found, it may just be, as Father Kittredge said at the beginning of my journey, a matter of faith. <laughs>